Okay, I think um, we've given people enough time uh, to make it to the call. So we'll just crack on. Uh, conscious we've got quite a few panelists on the call today, so um, I don't really want to waste too much time. So first of all, thank you all for deciding to join us on this uh, webinar. Um, I'm sure some of you would have other things to be doing on a Saturday evening, but uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, my name is Malobi, if you, some of you don't know, um, and I decided to create the Pan-African Hemp Association. Um, it's been an idea for a while, um, but with this COVID situation, you know, you tend to have a bit more extra time so you can start actually working on um, different projects that you had but never had time to execute. So um, this, is, this, this has been something I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, you know, we've got hemp associations all around the world, in India, in the States, in Canada. Um, we've got the Euro European Industrial Hemp Association. Um, so I decided we needed one for Africa. Uh, and, and when I say Pan-African as well, we also include the diaspora because, you know, we've got our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean and all over the world. So, yeah, it was all about bringing us together, organizing ourselves, advocating together, investing together, learning together. Uh, so that we can all achieve, you know, we can all win together. Um, so that was the original idea of creating the Pan-African Hemp Association. Uh, just a quick rundown on what's going to go down today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a brief overview of what we're trying to do with the Pan-African Hemp Association. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about hemp. Um, there's a lot of things that hemp can do, as some of you may know, but we're going to touch on a couple specific areas. Um, but, but, you know, we'll, we'll touch on them very lightly. We're not going to go too in-depth because we'll be here all day. Because as some of you already know, this is a fantastic plant that has many, many uses. Um, I think I read somewhere that it has over 25,000 different uses. So, um, and, and we really need to start educating ourselves about this plant. Um, understand the difference between marijuana and hemp. Um, and so that when we are advocating for it, talking about it with our friends and family, we know what we're talking about. I do have to emphasize as well that this is the Pan-African Hemp Association. It is not the Pan-African Pan Cannabis or Pan-African Pan Marijuana Association. I know that some of you are cannabis or mar marijuana advocates. Um, I personally am not against it, um, but I believe that sometimes it's better to be focused. Um, and if someone would like to create a Pan-African Cannabis or Marijuana Association, um, we would love to partner with you and work with you and promote stuff with you. But I think that, you know, sometimes when we try to do too many things at once, we kind of lose track or, or lose focus. So that's why we're focusing on hemp particularly. Um, we're not focusing on um, products with high THC, but we'll go into the differences further down the line in the presentation. So um, quick uh, housekeeping. So this was me sponsored by Zona Naturals. Full disclosure, this is, um, that's my mom in the top right. Yeah, she does look better than me. Um, <laughs> so she, she's actually the founder of the CBD company. Um, and, you know, we're, we're using the, the funds of this company to start, you know, building the marketing, the website, you know, networking, etc., and all the other kind of investments that are needed. The long-term plan is to have uh, an agenda for the Pan-African Hemp Association have a very similar structure to the European Industrial Hemp Association, which means that, you know, we'll have a, a board of directors, we'll have uh, members by different categories, whether you're a corporation, whether you're uh, policy advisors, whether you're lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and different people um, would, ha would pay different fees contributing to the association. But until we've actually come up with that, you know, plan and agenda, um, it, it only makes sense that to, for us to start funding it ourselves. Um, so yeah, this is our CBD brand. It's a family business. Um, you know, we're in the UK, the USA and Nigeria. Um, we're looking to partner with anyone that's interested in CBD. If you want to expand to a particular country, um, you've got our details at the bottom. Just Google Zona Naturals. Um, but yeah, we'll move on from that. Don't want to spend too much time on that. So about the Pan-African Hemp Association. Um, so what we're, what we're really trying to do is we're aiming to actually represent the interests of stakeholders across the hemp uh, value chain. Um, hold on one second. I seem to be having an issue with my computer. Sorry, guys. Uh, let me just sort this out. One second. Yeah, that should, should be fine. 
Yeah, so um, we're looking to educate, we're looking to innovate, um, and we believe in using all parts of the hemp plant, um, you know, all the way from the flower to the leaves, to the seeds, to the stalk, to the fibers, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really passionate about using hemp um, as a way of creating uh, not only sustainable uh, products, but also for the health and well-being of, of people uh, around the world, because uh, we're not just planning to sell our products in Africa, we want to, you know, export Africa to the world as well. Um, and we're, as I said earlier, we're open to partner with other groups, whether it be cannabis groups, whether it be um, other international hemp associations. I know there's a few different national hemp associations split across Africa. So we're happy to partner with these, these associations. Um, I put this here because some people, you know, uh, just because if you want to get into the hemp industry, you don't actually have to directly be farming hemp. Um, I think there's, there's a kind of misconception that, you know, I have to be an, you know, an expert with understanding the agronomy and how hemp is grown and how to extract certain products, etc. But to be honest, if you are a marketer, if you're a, in, you know, if you're a lawyer, you're in real estate, um, software development, you can be part of the hemp value chain. So I, I just put this here to just kind of give you guys some inspiration. If you find yourself in one of these sort of sectors or or sort of categories, um, just know that, you know, even finance, you know, you, you, you don't actually have to just be in the production side of things to be involved um, in the hemp industry. Um, and it's a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. So yeah, just, just keep that in mind and just know that any expertise that you have, you can add value to, to the hemp value chain. So just a quick note on hemp versus cannabis. Um, apologies to people that are already quite familiar with hemp, but I, I have to, because this is our first call, I want to make sure everyone's kind of on board, all on the same page. Um, so both hemp and, uh, and, and marijuana um, come from the cannabis plant, um, but how we distinct hemp from uh, marijuana in the most basic sense is the THC content. So THC, um, tetrahydrocannabinol, is one of the many compounds in a cannabis plant. And depending on the country, there are different thresholds. So say for example, if you are selling hemp in the United States, um, your THC content can't be um, higher than 0.3%. Uh, if, if you're in the EU, that might be 0.2%. So it depends on what um, part of the world you're in, but essentially it's usually the THC that, that is used to sort of distinguish between hemp and marijuana. Uh, and uh, like one of my colleagues likes to say, hemp has about 25,000 different uses and mar marijuana has, you know, just a few. So I'm not saying that to put down marijuana. Marijuana can be very medicinal and have many benefits, um, but hemp can be applied in many different sorts of industrial um, food, beverage, etc. cetera, um, cases. Um, just a quick note here as well on, you know, some of the many uses of hemp. Um, so. Uh, some of you may know that uh, in the UK, there was a big hemp processing manufacturer. Um, they specialized in animal bedding. Uh, unfortunately, they closed down. So if you're um, in the equestrian or um, if you know about horse riding or, or any, any, any sort of animals um, that requires the basic bedding, um, you can use hemp as a fiber for that. Um, fuel as well. Um, Henry Ford, his first, one of his first few cars were made out of hemp. Um, so the, the exterior of the car, because the hemp uh, material is very light and it's also very durable. So uh, many people don't know that actually, you know, hemp has been used to make cars in the past as well as as a biofuel. Um, yes. I, won't, I won't go into, um, can, Nana, if you, if you don't mind muting your um, uh, screen. Um, so yeah, in terms of food, uh, the hemp seeds as well, the hemp oil. I'm not going to go into all of these, but just to give you an understanding, also construction, I think. Construction and also um, when it comes to building uh, parts for cars, I think those are the two sort of biggest money plays with hemp, in my opinion. Um, stuff like CBD are kind of trendy at the moment, and it, there, there is a lot of use for it. But when you come to the industrial uses, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, money being made there. So, sorry, that's a slide. Um, yeah, some of you may have heard of CBD. I thought I'd put this in here because this is kind of a trendy um, thing right now. Um, you know, CBD has been used in many different kinds of products nowadays. You can get it in food and dog treats and drinks um, and oils and skincare. Um, it's, it's being put in pretty much everything. 
Um, so some of you might have heard of hemp through CBD, um, but just know that if you are in the FMCG space, CBD is also a great product to add because a lot of people, um, you know, like our brand tend to focus on being a CBD brand. But what we're actually trying to do now is pivot into be more of a kind of uh, a supplement brand, or you can be a cosmetic brand that has CBD as an ingredient. So you don't have to be a CBD brand per se, but you can have your own cosmetic skincare brand and just add CBD as an ingredient. Um, actually, was speaking to a CBD manufacturer in the UK who would be really interested. When, when he heard about this call, he said that he'd be interested in buying some of the CBD oil if um, so we can get stuff up and running in, in, in Ghana or, or, or South Africa. So yeah, many opportunities in the CBD industry. Um, I was speaking to a colleague of mine and, and she was telling me earlier, why did you put Thomas Jefferson as a quote? Um, but I, I just thought, I, I thought it'd be quite interesting because, you know, it is just to show you how long hemp has been known to be a useful product. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what the documentary was called, but um, during one of the, uh, I think it was in the 30s, um, the American government actually, you know, incentivized farmers to, to start growing hemp um, when they were gearing up for a war. I can't remember which one it is, so don't, I don't want to make any mistakes on here. Uh, I was talking about the Ford's hemp car as well. Um, you know, you know, it's a renewable material. You can use it for the, you know, biodiesel um, or sorry, um, ethanol, uh, plastic. Um, it's 10 times stronger than steel and is a lot lighter. Uh, again, about THC and CBD, we've kind of gone over that, but just to show you that, um, to talk a little bit more about the cannabinoid system. So the human body has what is called a cannab endocannabinoid system. And our bodies react to phytocannabinoids, which is what is found in products like CBD. Um, and more, more on this, I can, I can send sort of um, PDFs on this, but I don't want to get too technical. But essentially, the, the point of this slide is just to talk about, you know, there's THC, there's CBD, and there's many other cannabinoids found in the hemp plant that can be help, um, healthy for the human system. Again, um, some trends. Uh, just to let you guys know, for those of you that are curious, um, I, I will be recording this webinar and um, I'll share it with uh, you at the end of the, I'll share my email with you. So if you want to get the slides, I can share that with you. So in terms of um, some of the uses of, you know, CBD, I can't make any claims, but, um, you know, it is, it has been found from, from re previous research to reduce anxiety, um, inflammation, chronic pain, um, and relax muscles with patients, uh, with MS and, and, and a lot of different uses. So, um, you know, stress, insomnia, but yeah, do your research. I suggest, um, look into it, um, and, and learn more about CBD because it's, it's really interesting right now, uh, that industry. Um, so yeah, we'll just be moving on to the next panelist. Um, Joel, are you there? I am. I am here. Yes. Hi, Joel. How are you? Yes, not too bad. Thank you for inviting me to today's uh, conversation. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, yeah, Joel. So uh, you and I met a couple years back um, at one of your events uh, hosted by Metacana. Can you give us a brief overview of, of Metacana? You know what you're about and what what you're looking to do. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, again, uh, just so you know, I, I, I'm not sure if anybody can see me. I'm still, you still have the Haley Empress house page up. Oh, okay. We'll stop sharing screen then. It's fine. There we go. Yeah. I think everybody can see me now, just yeah. in case. Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you, Malobi, for that introduction. And yes, it was uh, uh, actually only two years ago at London's inaugural European Cannabis Week. Uh, that I put on an event through my company, Metacana, which is where I met you, Malobi, because if you remember, and just to kind of let everybody know, uh, my company uh, is kind of gone for a number of different guises, founded in 2016, and in the first instance, uh, was kind of using the company as a consultancy to kind of brokerage uh, deals within the international supply chain. This kind of arrangements, professional networking for people, uh, and it's kind of like, yeah, bringing like different uh, pots of money and farmers, bioremediators and stuff together. However, then in London, as the kind of cannabis conversation started to kind of pick up and uh, uh, serious finance and people at a top level were starting to kind of take notice, there was all of a sudden like money for, uh, for events, 
uh, sponsors wanted to get involved. And so that event that I had, I'd invited, I remember, uh, it was a panel, on my panel, I had uh, the, the head of uh, the Cannabinoid Trust. I had uh, the founder of Grace's London, uh, an amazing brand. And uh, actually my oh, wife as well, who's also uh, a, a brand founder from a company, Cold and Raw. But if I remember correctly, the, one of the conversations that we had that day on the panel was about the uh, where does Africa or where does, uh, in essence, a lot of the world's uh, developing countries and developing economies, how do they fit into this nascent industry, which is already uh, being co-opted at the top by the North Americans, the, the, uh, the Europeans who again, ironically, when you look at the history of this, created the legal framework that has put everybody behind and then they've changed the framework themselves to enable to jump ahead in this moment. Uh, and so, yeah, I remember that our conversation, we talked about many of the strains that people now think and know to be American strains, that actually the history of some of those seeds are from West Africa and particularly Nigeria. So, I mean, again, an interesting anecdote to start. But yes, yeah. Metcana in that since that time again has now kind of carried on in its development with the professional networking that putting on events uh, allows, and we're now looking at uh, projects. Uh, and again, kind of kudos and a nod to, to Hewa and what she was saying before, and that is that with the industrial hemp uh, and it's uh, not only its ubiquity but its utilitarian like uh, uses that for a future in which we intend or we have to be a sustainable and regenerative by, by design. Uh, uh, the, the, the future of, of hemp uh, and especially with regards to construction is going to like change everything from how we once knew the, the very linear steel and concrete model. Because again, with your, the, the hemp and even with the, the imagery that you used at the beginning, uh, there is the opportunity for a fully vertically integrated uh, supply and value chain with the hemp plant from the fuels, from the machines that use those fuels to then the delivery, the distribution, and ultimately as well, even like uh, the, the, the building blocks. Now, my company, uh, Metacana, primarily has been involved in looking at medical cannabis uh, and like its growth in different regions, including Jamaica, Colombia, Costa Rica, uh, but now as well, the, the landscape is changing in Africa and also in Southeast Asia, uh, which is actually where my next project will be uh, in development. Now, in the last uh, two years, Thailand has already uh, changed its legal landscape. And in Thailand now, from in essence, Southeast Asia was probably the most uh, difficult place to be involved in any of this because punishments were literally death. There was no conversation. But now in Thailand, they've actually flipped that already to being uh, fully legalized for cultivation and for medical use. Uh, and they uh, already have uh, an industry which is worth over 600 million uh, a year and is looking to like top a billion by 2023 because of as well, it kind of sits on a Venn diagram with their tourism industry. Mm. So again, it's when we look at all these different like facts, these different kind of pieces of information, that are kind of like uh, changing and crystallizing around the world. Uh, and also again, to speak to Hewat's point that ultimately the, the barrier to entry in all of the jurisdictions around the world is regulation and, and, and legislation. And it's about being able to form coalitions with uh, appropriate and relevant stakeholders across like municipal and governmental uh, like uh, horizontals so that as the laws and these regulations do slowly change, that people at the level of this conversation that we're having now, in essence, entry level entrepreneurs and investors can be part of something which otherwise currently faces the risk of going the same way as uh, 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 post prohibition alcohol in America where in essence like robber barons and rich people who have already set up different criminal enterprises dive straight in and become the leaders in it. And so I think, yeah, uh, I mean, I didn't know necessarily what the conversation would uh, pertain to and contain today, uh, but uh, what I do know is that the work that you're doing here in creating uh, an, an association like this 
and again looking at ways of decentralizing uh, these conversations and also bringing people from other industries like for example uh, cryptocurrency and other ways of decentralizing power into these associations and conversations is going to be very important for us to be able to have uh, real like kind of like stake in, 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 in this industry as it moves forward. I know that for myself, as somebody who was formerly before going into the, in the cannabis industry, I was on the senior management team at the Africa Centre in the UK. I was on the board for Africa in London, uh, was part of the Greater London Authority, and I'm now the sustainability champion for the Vegan Society globally. But what I recognise in all of those roles and the conversations is what I kind of hear all of the time, and we speak a lot about since the 1880 uh, Berlin Conference where they split up Africa. The same thing is happening again and I just want to make sure that by bringing stakeholders like us together and having meaningful conversations and also by supporting entrepreneurs like he and others within our group uh, whether or not that be through crowdfunding crowdsourcing or even just through social support that the time is on us now and it is incumbent for us to be to, to, to do something if we really want to become uh, a part of this wow wow um Thank you so much for that. You've actually kind of <laughs> answered most of the questions that I wanted to, to ask. So um, in, in, the interest, in the interest of moving on, before moving on to the next guys, um, Nana from uh, HAG, I'll just ask you uh, one more question. Um, just to play devil's advocate here, because, you know, what we do see, like you said, in the States, um, a lot of people from the black community, <laughs> per se, um, are not able to participate in the, the cannabis industry. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the, the black community in the States were the ones that were the most involved in it. They were the ones that had a three strike rule. They were the ones that suffered the consequences of, of, you know, being involved in the cannabis business before it became legalized. And now, um, we're kind of being financially pushed out. And that's, 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 you know, that's a, that's a given. We, we all kind of know that, but to what extent do you think it is up to us as black people, as a community to actually, you know, take the initiative put our money together and actually invest in it as opposed to it just being a problem outside of us. What, what point do you think is our responsibility or do you think we're, we're not investing enough in this industry? Well, again, interesting to dial that back uh, is even with regards to what we mean by invest because invest can sometimes be a myriad word and people look at it and think that we're talking about money when investment can be like in, in, in time, in practice, in thought leadership uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Because what I would say is that uh, the mistake that we would make uh, if, if we were to look at that investment as financial only is for us to think that by playing the stock market game and us putting like, you know, our money that we've saved or even like, you know, our sovereign wealth into the investment pots of other people's grows and other people's cultivation, like is, is a very short-term view. I think that the investment has to be made at the, again, at the, at the governmental and at the, 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 the almost like a, a communal philosophical level that we have to recognize that this plant, I mean, again, just to go back to the point you mentioned about the, the myriad uses of, of the hemp plant. And, and obviously, I mean, I was shaking my head on silent when you were saying that marijuana doesn't have anywhere near as many because it, it does as well. This oh, plant really? has okay. kind of grown like uh, next to human, uh, next to humans, like, you know, for the length of, of, of our history. And it is developed alongside us, which is the reason why we have that endocannabinoid system inside of us. Unlike a lot of the other uh, 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 plants or crops that, you know, the world's like four or five massive agricultural, like kind of like behemoth companies like have, uh, uh, hemp, and again, to, to hear what's point, grows quickly, it doesn't need uh, the, the, uh, the chemical treatment. There are a lot of ways of actually being able to produce hemp like quite cheaply. And actually a lot of the old methods, like ancient methods that predate like uh, Western uh, industrialization can actually be beneficial to the, to the long term of the plant. Uh, so I would say that the investment kind of has to come uh, with regards to an understanding of our, of our ecology, uh, and of our, of our local geographies. And it would be about us also petitioning our local governments uh, across Africa and across the diaspora where we have like, you know, control, where we are landowners to recognize that actually we have some of the most, uh, uh, the, the best soil 
and the, the most biodiverse regions in the world to actually be producing the highest quality. So just to kind of dial that all the way back to the first point of your question is that I think we just need to reimagine what investment means. And I think that investment should be in ourselves long before we look at putting our money into other people's cannabis, whether or not that be hemp or medical cannabis growth. Thank, thank you very much, Joel. Um, brilliant answer. And thanks for the correction with the uh, marijuana hem thing. I'll definitely look, look more into that because uh, my special um, expertise is more on the hem side. But thanks again. Um, so, yeah, I'll now be moving on to Nana from the Hemp Association of Ghana so, so that we can get some real tangible uh, current understanding of, you know, stuff that's actually going on in the continent, stuff that's recent. Um, so, Nana, um, please introduce yourself, uh, your association, uh, your company, and, and what you guys have been doing. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nana Kwajiman. I'm the president of the Hempire Association of Ghana, founder member as well. Um, and I'm also the chief executive officer of Hempire Agri Ghana. In fact, to take it a bit further, because you're talking about Pan-Africanism, um, I guess I'm the president of the Hempire Association of Africa, um, because we do have a company that we've registered uh, in that way. And we have about 14 different African countries on a WhatsApp, on a WhatsApp platform, separate countries like Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, Mali, Nigeria, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, you know. Um, so there's about 14 at the moment. But because of the challenges that we've had in Ghana, we've, we've put that on the shelf. Um, and we're forging through with the advocacy, uh, first and foremost, for the full legalization. And, um, and unfortunately, in doing so, we only got 50% of that, which was the decriminalization of cannabis sativa L industrial hemp um, with a THC cap of 0 0.3. I mean, that we still see uh, as a victory of sorts because it opens the door for further discourse about the full legalization. We, at the Hemp Association, we write um, a weekly uh, column, which highlights many of the issues I've heard some of you speak about here. And we try to hemp educate the population of Ghana because culturally we've been taught that it's a, a very bad thing. And, you know, I, let me just pop in one or two things. Let's not be afraid to say that it, it was racism that ensured that there was a prohibition on cannabis and, and that we were victimized on that basis and we're still being victimized and killed, you know, on that basis. Let's not be afraid to say, I'm sitting on the platform because I'm into black first with no apology. That's why I'm sitting on this platform. Don't be afraid to say it. You know, we, you, we totter around the word European and blah, blah, blah. White people we're talking about. We're talking about the racist behavior of white people and how we have been victimized through this plant, imprisoned unnecessarily, lives lost, etc. As Joe said, you know, they made the prohibition laws and they were busy chasing us around, locking us up while they were researching. And when they finished researching now, they've changed the law back and now they're in the lead, you know. But what it is, is we must catch up. And, you know, this is one of the beginnings of catching up. We have to do real things, pragmatic things. I mean, um, I want to say that um, I agree financial investment isn't the only investment. Um, that's absolutely true. But it is the most significant investment because without finance, all the things that we're talking about will not materialize. They will just be a figment of our imagination. Now, here in Ghana, um, first and foremost, the Hemp Association of Ghana, which is the short name for Hempire, we've been campaigning for the legalization, full legalization of cannabis, because I also have to back my brother, Bear Malabo, uh, you must go back to the drawing board on THC, because let me tell you, that is what heals people. That is really the healer. It's not the CBD at all. And in terms of 
generating income, that is where the income is generated as well. Even though this income in industrial MP is very, very good, it's not the real deal. Trust me, and you look, you've been mentioned in some places when Illinois opened up on the first day of, of um, selling medicinal marijuana from their dispensaries and recreational marijuana, as they call it, it was 3.2 million in taxes for the government. Not talking about what dispensaries of Illinois made, just talking about the taxes for the government. That's where the real money is. But at the end of the day, in terms of uses, hemp far outweighs the uses of, of medicinal marijuana, but it doesn't make medicinal marijuana any less potent because that's the business. So where we are now, I hear we talk about regulations being uh, a barrier. That, that's true. And that's why we've written the legislative instrument ourselves and submitted it to the Narcotics Control Commission submitted it to the Attorney General, and we're forcing the issue so it has a hearing in Parliament, because it's in Parliament that le legislative instruments are, are passed um, as, a, as, a, as the governor of the law itself. So we've written it ourselves, um, because we believe that if you, know, you don't know the rules of the game, you won't be able to play. So that's what we've done ourselves. We're waiting for that to go through because we've already had the law passed for industrial hemp, already received presidential um, ascendancy, etc. This is the last aspect. And because we're, we're going to have a general election soon, what's going to happen is when um, Parliament um, returns from recess, the, that legislative instrument would have already been laid on the floor administratively for a period of 21 days, which is the requirement. And then there'll be some debate, um, they'll fix the fees there because only Parliament can fix the fees for um, securing a license. They'll fix the fees there. And of course, we'll be involved lobbying at that point to ensure we're talking about the lowest fees uh, possible because at the end of the day, we don't want to create um, a scenario whereby only large multinational companies can come in and take advantage. And that's why at Hempire Agri Ghana, we've registered farmers um, and we've turned them into people who were living below the line, below the radar, into people who now have their tax identification numbers, their companies are now registered, we're working on business plans with them. We've given them off-takers agreement because without the off-takers agreement, you can't apply for a license anyway because they're going to ask you, so what are you going to do with it when you grow it? Um, we also provide, will provide the seeds for these farmers and technical advice and the training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we will prepare their, their application, provide them with a letter of support and a certificate indicating that they are a subsidiary of Empire Agri Ghana and uh, knock the door and, and lead them through. Now, one of, the, one of the best things that's happened quite recently is that we applied for 70,000 acres that we have earmarked for enclave farming to come under the government's uh, One District, One Factory initiative. They came by, they took business plans, interviewed, etc., etc., numerous meetings. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the Ministry of Trade and Industry, through their secretariat of one district, one factory, has approved Empire Agri Ghana uh, as coming under that initiative. Now, what that means is, I mean, we have our business plan and everything lined up already. It's written already. We're actually amending things as more strategic partners come on board from the Americas and Europe, et cetera, et cetera. What's happening is that means that the Ministry of Trade and Industry will tell their own government agency, which is NARCO, the Narcotics Control Commission, to issue a license to or every license that Empire Agri Ghana will apply for uh, because 
now we come under that government initiative. And basically on that, on the, on that initiative, we said, we indicated to them that we had 70,000 acres across uh, seven regions out of the 16 regions in Ghana. And that once we're given the license, first and foremost, we will cultivate 100 acres in those seven regions. Yeah, that's the first thing we would do. Um, that would give a, that would generate an income of, of almost 19 million in the first cycle. Um, we also said to them that we have a 500 acre facility whereby we are going to convert some warehouses into a laboratory, into a, a, a shear butter plant, um, into uh, an extraction plant for extracting the CBD out of the flowers, etc. We're also splitting a huge warehouse in two because we're going to wage a war on those people who make plastics out of uh, petroleum products. And we're going to start producing uh, plastic and fight against those who are producing the plastics that block our drains every year and people die simply because we have heavy, heavy rainfall. And then on the other side, and this is why I liked what uh, uh, Haile Hempress was talking about, is, is the hemp treat. Um, and um, we'd like to invite Hailey over actually because I mean I love the things that she was saying um, you know very informative I mean let's say she was saying a third that we didn't know about and and I'm enthused when I look at the building she's a, she's constructed already because I can say that what we've got on our hands is is the construction of a hundred bed hospital which we're about to sign an agreement about. And we've already indicated that that hospital will be built out of hempcrete. We have no idea how it's done, but we have the vision. <clears throat> we have the vision and we're prepared to push through with our vision. And now we have seen through the presentation of uh, Eile Empress that these people can extend our vision and make it a reality. So we want to construct a 100-bed hospital. We want to construct it with Haile Empress uh, at the lead because she has shown us a lot more, given us a lot more insight into the whole thing. But you see, um, these are things that are on, they're on the table right now. And I, am, I envisage that between now and November, that we will start implementing these things, irrespective of the fact that we don't have a license. Because the key to this whole argument is that we need to participate. And no matter what barriers there are there, we must be proactive. Yes, we must be thinking proactive so that we take them on this their own game. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if the only way to take control of this market is to participate in it, and I think, because I've been in London for some, some time and I've been a part of many of these organizations and I know there's a lot of highly intellectual people there, et cetera, et cetera, but they're not movers and shakers. You know, they're talkers. And we need movers and shakers to follow the direction of the talkers because don't get me wrong, the talkers are very important. Those are people who will think the whole thing through, analyze the whole thing through, come up with structures and strategies, et cetera, et cetera. We need to get a move on with this. And in Ghana, we're getting a move on with this because even though we won't have a license, we'll start constructing laboratory. We'll start constructing shea butter processing whereby we're going to infuse CBD into shea butter to make numerous products, shampoos, gels, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's simple, it's simple. It is about money and we have to put our neck in the block because we don't have the financial backing as individuals, et cetera, as we should, because that's been taken away from us. That right has been taken away from us before we were born. So unfortunately, we have to use some of the financial institutions that there and take what we can get from there in terms of loans or go through the granting system because there are lots of structures there in European countries where we as entrepreneurs, if you like, can approach them and they're prepared to give us assistance. There's, there's lots of them. But essentially, 
us at Empire Ivory Ghana and Hemp Association of Ghana, we're, we're into doing things. We want to do things. And if we're going to reclaim that business back, which is billions of dollars, a billion dollar business, we must start participating. And, and that's why we're moving forward in this way. We don't have any license or anything. We don't have any authority to issue any license. But we've registered over 500 farmers so far. We have 70,000 acres and it's rising. And we're ready to construct various things right now. And, and more to the point, we've been approved by government now, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, as coming under the all species of one district, one factory. We have up to five years tax-free to import all the machinery that we need, of course, this calls for finance. We must go and find the finance and ensure that these happens because by and large, two thirds of the farmers that we have registered are farmers who currently cultivate marijuana. They're on the wrong side of the law and we are with them, we've registered them, we've, we've written to the ministries of interior and defense, we've written to the Narcotics Control Commission to say, look, these farmers are in a transition and no one should go and raid their fields and burn their fields and arrest people, etc. Because it's not just an issue of, oh, it's young people who have started cultivating. This is a generational thing. Fathers have introduced their son to it many, many times and over, especially in Ghana here. So these are the farmers who we believe have some expertise that we can utilize as well as refine because we know that with the advent of technology and everything, we're learning new things every day. But essentially these farmers have been farming under the radar and using different methods that we've transcended beyond. So we need to provide them with the technical ability and the technical know-how to move forward. And they, for us, they are national assets of Ghana because Industrial hemp is not a small business and it can transform Ghana in a very, very, very big way and transform the continent. And that's why I love the Pan-African thing. And, you know, somehow we will have to merge the Empire Association of Ghana with the Pan-African Hemp Association. And it's true. We must form something that is like the European Hemp Association. We must have a manifesto that, you know, there's, there's so many things that we need to have because the Europeans are coming to Africa to cultivate hemp or to cultivate marijuana because it's much more cheaper. Their labor is cheap. They don't, in many instances, they don't have to use greenhouses. They won't be using any lights. They're, you know, there won't be this ventilation issue and all this kind of stuff. And they'll be able to reap the benefits. You know, they're coming here. And we're sitting here, watch them. And I'm saying the time to watch them is over. But we've seen everything unfold in our eyes. We know what's happening in America and the United Kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. We're just a small group. We're just a small percentage of that overall pie. And at the end of the day, there are other small percentages in that pie that are moving. It's now time for us to, as a part of that pie, get moving and things are moving in Ghana and we believe that we can influence the movement of things across the country simply because of the way that we have proactively dealt with this issue and sat on it for a very 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 long time so uh, that's us I mean uh, Howlett, um, Howlett Schultz <laughs> we are waiting for you we, you get hold of us we'll write your letter of invitation you come over and stay for a little while you've got a lot to teach us and we can show you the lands that we have and the plans that we have for those those particular lands and low cost affordable housing because you know every four years when it comes to campaigning the uh, the politicians talk about they're going to do low-cost housing, this and that. And here in Ghana, you can't afford low-cost housing. It's for the middle class. But nonetheless, with industrial hemp, you can have real low-cost affordable housing. And this is something that is also a banger in Ghana. And people are sleeping. I mean, people, a lot of people look at me and say, yeah, you're, you're knowledgeable and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I tell them, let me tell you something. In the land of the blind, 
the man with one eye is the king. And, and that's all that is about. Because we're sleeping here in Ghana, we're sleeping here in Canada, we're sleeping here in the Americas, we're sleeping there in, 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 in Europe, we're sleeping. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're sleeping. It's time to wake everybody up. And the way to wake everybody up is with a positive movement forward, a positive vibes and a positive movement forward. So for us, we, we welcome this, you know, I, I, I like this because we've not been able to take the Empire African Association any further than just register it, registering it and talking to people on different groups. It's a significant step. However, I think what you're talking about takes us two, three, even four or five steps further in, in what we need to do. Very important. We must be like, we must be like OPEC so that nobody can come in and pick off different countries for different prices. We must control the price. We must tell them what the price is. Not them tell us what the price is. We tell them what the price is. This is how it's got to go with no apology. No apology at all. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nana. Um, yeah, that was brilliant. Um, first of all, you know, I'm very happy that you've managed to connect with Hivots. It's That's essentially why we're here. We want to make these connections. We want to start communicating with each other, want to invest with each other, share knowledge. So that is the reason why we're here. And I'm so happy that we're making these connections online. Um, thank you for your hempucation. We're going to be using that word from now on. Sounds a lot cooler. Um, and, and yeah, you know, in the interest of time, I have, I, I have so many questions for you but I have to move on. Um, but we'll hopefully be having more of these. We can go even deeper. Um, and yeah, I hope that at the end of the, at the, end of the call, um, I'll share the WhatsApp chat. I'll share our details so everyone can communicate with each other more effectively. Um, that being said, I'll have to move on um, to our penultimate uh, panelist, Sheik. Um, and then we're going to go on to Jake after that. Um, we're going to try and make this quick, guys, because I'm conscious people have been here for a while. Uh, Sheikh, are you there? Let's just make sure he's there. Sheikh, if he's not here, we'll just move on to Jake. Um, and then, Jake, maybe what you can do is um, introduce yourself, your company. You know, give us a, give us a summary of what you've heard today um, and, and your suggestions moving forward. You're going to hear a lot of good things from me, not already, right? So you have been waiting for our day. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Jake. I'm the founder of Akuno Group. Akuno Group is basically what everything my brother Nana talked about, uh, deleting Europeans from coming to Africa and taking our product and taking all the money. What Hakuna does is basically put himself in between the Africans and European market. What we, what we specialize in right now is sweet potato, ginger, and avocado. We realize that, um, for example, in West Africa, they don't have avocado, a has avocado. With all the projects we are starting. We also started a project in, in Rwanda with um, sweet potato farming. And obviously, I met you three weeks ago, and obviously, I've been in weed and cannabis for a long time, but not at this level. What I'm here to talk about is uh, uh, investment, process, value, and uh, business itself, and getting money into Ghana and Africa itself. I want to point out some of the, um, the, 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 the partners that Joel made, for example, in investment to Africa and investments to everything. And then I said, yes, investment. <laughs> I think the most important thing in Africa. Uh, what I want to talk about is the most, okay, we, 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 we as Africans, we do have uh, a lot of things to offer the world, but at the same time, we don't have structure. We want to understand what I mean. We create groups, we do different things, we want to be involved. Every time something happens, we create a group for it, but nothing happens at the same time. I'm here basically to explain that all the stuff you talked about, yes, sounds nice, it sounds really great, but it's a huge process involved. Like Nana just said, he has 70, like 7,000 7, 7, acres of land. I don't understand why you only think about uh, hemp and cannabis and shea butter. For example, you have ginger, that's a big market. You have sweet potato, that's a big market. You have avocado, that's a big market. There's lots of stuff you can do to get money into Ghana to lobby on the government to legalize cannabis. Because at the end of the day, money rules the world, right? We all agree under the aspect. Um, we also have to talk about value chain, which is really, really important when it comes to cannabis or hemp from Africa. And I think Edwin, my uh, uh, CC, always can come talk about it with you guys. Let me come here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hello, guys. I'm Edwin here. Uh, thank you, Jake, for that. 
Um, currently, we're also in operations in Ghana, and what we've seen is that uh, even in what is legal, uh, it's very hard to get the operations running on the ground. So working on up to 15,000 hectares with the uh, partners of ours on the ground, we're trying to, trying to get product, trying to get the value chain governance in line, trying to get the facilitation going, getting all the stakeholders in one room is already a hard thing for commodities that governments back home are already um, uh, sort of uh, experts in, 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 in bringing to the market. So now that you're bringing something one would call on the fringe, um, uh, hemp uh, production, that is something the governments are quite conservative about. So what we are trying to do is get product, I mean, uh, get money from our value chains that we have running, up to nine of them, and then get into lo the lobbying itself. What we have seen in this meeting is that the stakeholders that we've convened in a meeting like this uh, in the Hemp uh, Pan-African Association is the lobbyists and the people on the governance uh, side. So how is it that we can fast track this and bring in our own operations that um, we already have structured on the ground to get us into the export value chain of the hemp? That, that is one of the things that I was looking forward to. But already, if you talk about the structuring of the value chain, there's a lot and a lot of things in play if we want to start exploitation of this uh, product itself. All right. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, this is, this is why I love the Hakuna guys. They're very straight talking. Um, you know, Jake doesn't, doesn't beat around the bush, and I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sort of supply chain and operations, these guys have a lot of experience. Um, having, it's only been a few weeks that I've been working with them and um, they, they've shown me a lot of what they've been doing. So guys, um, just to kind of wrap up the panel, um, what, what would you say has been the, the main sort of uh, challenges you encounter in terms of building an a agricultural supply chain in a different African countries that you're operating in? Um, so that, you know, uh, the other people in the panel can know that and know how to kind of prepare themselves. Okay, so basically when I got involved in agriculture, I got in involved a year and a half ago randomly. I was speaking to a client who wanted to hop into uh, Nigeria with his energy drink called Pure Gold. In between the conversation, he asked me if I could supply him with a million kilograms of, um, how do you call it, with sweet potato per week. Of course, I didn't know anything about agriculture, but I said, of course, after that sweet potato, no problem. Well, you start doing your process, you get into Nigeria, and you realize, yes, they're the second, uh, second biggest producer in the world of sweet potato, but yet they have zero percent in export. So you start first by figuring out what sweet potato down on the ground, and obviously they have orange flesh sweet potato, but nobody down there knows what orange flesh Europeans like, so they're lacking information. Then you have the herd to pass, which is the government. You have to, you have to also think about the suppliers. Then you have to think about transportation. You have to think about certification, global gap, um, Rainforest Alliance, fair trade. Then up, uh, on top of that, you have to think about um, insurance. After that, you have to think about at the same time that the Africans don't understand that the world works on credit. So for example, when you have a, uh, a supplier down in Africa, you have a client that tells them, I want 50 containers of sweet potato. The client says, we're going to do all on consignment. We're going to sign a contract with contracts are legal here. When you get on the ground, explain that to them, he says no. But a lot of people don't understand, suppliers here have thousands of supplies, and they're going to pay down payment for every single one because that makes no sense in the supply chain itself or for their balance sheet. Most of the Africans on the ground think cash money business. We have to get away from the attitude that everything is money right away. We have to learn how to use credit and let off credit and trust, like business trust at the same time. Obviously, trust in Africa is a big issue between ourselves and each other and the Europeans because it's been taking advantage of us for a long time. But the biggest issue in Africa, I would say, is trust. Right? I mean, it's trust. It's trust also in taking, uh, like, uh, loving, let's say, a European more than your own brother. That's also a big problem. Let's say if I come down to Ghana and I do business down there, if I brought one of my partners, which is Michon, who is a completely good European who's going to help us out, they would rather work with him than with me. So, so we have to get away also, think about racism to each other, not personally racism to the white man. But in a way, we cannot delete ourselves of the white man because I have a white father, I have a half a white father, I have a half white sister. That makes no sense to go walking around and saying, yeah, it's your fault what the Europeans did 80 years ago. So please, brothers and sisters, get away from that attitude because we need everybody. If we're talking about white people, what about the Chinese? 700,000 Chinese people live in China. So get off the attitude of racism. We have to build ourselves on top of each other while including people, but this time on a different aspect. We take control, we lead the team. 
we work together and create an operation. So the biggest problem in Africa, I'm telling you, is trust and money and lobbying. We have to lobby the governments correctly. We don't have to be afraid to go in the government. We have to use what Africa knows best is rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. And uh, um, thanks for sharing that. I, I'm very, I'm very conscious that, you know, we've been doing this for a while and thank you very much for every, to everyone that's actually stayed with us till right at the end. Um, I'm just going to um, wrap things up because I'd hate for this to be one of those um, situations where we have a nice chat and then there's no sort of next steps. Like what do we do next? How do we start working together moving forward? Um, so let me just... Second. So yeah, uh, in terms of next steps, um, as I said, um, the Pan African Hemp Association is a, it's a new project, so we're going to need people on you know all across the kind of value chain. Um, if you want to take part in the Pan African Hemp Association, if you want to bring your expertise, if you want to help us in any way, um, if you want to be part of the board, if you want to be anything, just drop an email to info at panafricantraders.com. Like, I'll say it again, info at panafricantraders.com. Um, I'll drop that in the chat um, right at the end. But uh, we're going to be, and also what we're going to be doing is we're going to create a new website. Um, the email is going to be a new one. It will be a hemp association, etc. But this is the current email. So any questions, if you want to reach out to one of the panelists, if you want to work with us, send us an email. Um, secondly, um, I'm going to be creating a, another, uh, we've got one WhatsApp group. I'm going to be creating a separate one. Uh, and this one will be more for uh, purely on an investment basis. Um, we already have the current uh, Pan-African Hemp Association WhatsApp group. Um, if you want to get access to that, drop an email as well. But um, we, what I really believe in is having a close, tight-knit, very serious, very focused group of investors that are looking to invest in hemp projects in Africa, whether it be in Ghana, wherever. Um, so I'm going to create a separate WhatsApp group for that. And then we're going to build the website and we're going to split everyone into individual roles. So when you sign up on our website, you'll be able to say, okay, I'm a farmer, I'm a producer, I'm an offtake, I'm an aggregator, I'm a buyer. And we're going to split the website in that structure. So we're working on that over the next couple of weeks. But the main thing you need to take away is that email address, any information that you need, drop us a line. And then also, um, we're going to try and organize a meetup in Ghana in December. Um, I'm working with a colleague right now um, with the Beyond the Return um, meetups that are going on in the December time. So if any of you are going to be in Ghana, um, we're going to organize that. Well, I'm going to share more information on that on the WhatsApp group as well. Um, so again, thank you very much to the panelists. Um, thank you for giving all your two cents and all the information that you've shared. Thank you guys for being extremely patient. This has been a very long chat. Um, and we will be organizing more talks um, if you want the recording of the seminar or webinar, I'll be sending that to you if you drop me an email to that email address. And um, yeah, I really look forward to working with all of you and enjoy the rest of your evening and have a nice Saturday. All the best. Thank you very thank much. You. Also to thank the you. Host. And thank, thank you very much for taking okay, the initiative thank to make you. it happen. So thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a nice day, guys. Drop me an email. Yeah, man, respect.